Okay, so we're in session three of um, spiritual strongholds and intercession. And um, we've switched it up a bit tonight. Pastor Garth was going to do um, the majority of it. But um, um, this morning, God just totally, anything I prepared for my section, he totally did away with. So we're going to do, we're just going to get through this because there's a lot here. It took me all day to prepare this. And, um, and I just believe he wants to say something in this. So we're going to hopefully get through this. And then we're going to um, have time where we're going to actually spend time in intercession, intercession. So I don't know if you all have been involved in what intercession looks like as a corporate body, but we're going to do it. And um, we're going to hear God and we're going to get some things accomplished today. So, um, so anyway, um, I had prepared something different, but he, he led me to 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 6. I'm going to do a lot of scripture. So if you can't get it all, um, I'd rather you hear what's being said than write down the scripture. You can always get the reference from me later. <clears throat> And this is just standard. For the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And we know that we are called as Christians to pull down the strongholds of the enemy to see God's will released on the earth. So I wanted to read um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6 in three different versions, which kind of gives you a, um, a better picture of what what we're doing when we're in intercession. So the first one's the King James Version, and it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And as you notice, it says when your obedience is fulfilled. So we have to be in the right place to be able to even go into this position to tear down strongholds. So um, in the Amplified, it says the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're weapons, the uh, physical meaning weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Destruction of fortresses, I mean, that sounds a lot bigger than strongholds to me. As something more stable, more solid, but we have the ability to tear those down. We're destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ, being ready to punish every act of disobedience when your own obedience, and it says, as a church as a church that says a group is complete. And then the message, which I love, because it's sort of an in-your-face kind of Bible, you know? So uh, the world is unprincipled. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live to fight our battles that way, never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they're for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use powerful God tools for swat, excuse me, smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. And I like that because it's like, you got to do it. You know, I always say our worship, but, you know, I tell Jason when he was doing it, you know, it's got to be this. It's like attack. We're worshiping God, and we're tearing down stuff at the same time. And I like the message because it's sort of like that. You know, it's, it's, this is the way it is, guys, and let's get it right, you know. So um, Israel was God's chosen people who fought nat uh, natural human enemy soldiers with natural weapons. The Church of Jesus Christ were God's spiritual warriors, and we fight evil armies in the heavenlies. The saints are spirit people, we're spirit people, who do spiritual warfare in a spirit world. We're not doing warfare here. We're doing warfare in a spirit realm. And the saints fight from their spiritual headquarters, their heavenly places in Christ, at the right hand of God. Their ability to pray isn't a spirit... <clears throat> okay, wait a minute. My typing is off. 
Their ability to pray in a spirit language is one of their greatest spiritual weapons of warfare. So when we intercede this uh, evening, before we go, we're gonna be praying a lot in the Holy Ghost because that's where we're gonna get our direction from God. Our Lord Jesus is not only the king of all kings, he's also the warrior of warriors. Exodus 15:3 declares, the Lord is a man of war. Other translations of that verse state, the Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is a warlike one. The Lord, the warrior God, Jehovah is mighty in battle and the eternal knows well how to fight. As I said before, he's the master strategist. He knows everything from the beginning to the end, the first, the last. He knows how to defeat the enemy. He did it once and he can teach us to do it. So when we go into intercession, we're fighting that battle with Jesus. So I just wanted to review a couple of our major weapons of warfare. This is probably not new to you, but the first one being, of course, the word of God. Ephesians 6.17 says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And when we choose to accept God's thoughts, we come to odds with the devil's lies. We fight the lie with the truth of God's word. Jesus used this weapon in the wilderness to defeat the devil. You know, he kept saying, devil tempted him. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's how he defeated the enemy with the word of God. Number two, prayer. Ephesians 6.18. Praying in the spirit always with all kinds of prayer and supplication. We pray in the spirit. We don't pray with our mind, with our own intelligence, but allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us the will of the Father. And prayer releases the weapons of God into the spiritual battlefield in heavenly places. When we're praying in the spirit, we're getting that divine direction. We may not understand what we're getting, but God's downloading to us. And that's the place we want to be when we go to intercede is we want we want to know what he has to say about what's going on. We can see with our natural eyes, but we want to know what heaven's saying. So we'll get to that. <clears throat> Third weapon is praise and worship. In 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was going to fight against an enemy. And he did what good kings should do. He called a prayer assembly and a fast. How many times do we do that? Or we don't do that. When we have a situation in our churches or in our families, do we pray and do we fast? We just expect God to just show up and fix it, and we mumble a little prayer as we run out the door, and, and we don't wonder why our prayers don't get answered. Prayer takes some time and effort. So during this prayer assembly, God gave the battle plans and assured them that they wouldn't need to fight because God would go in before them and defeat the enemy. And scripture says, when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, so they were defeated. So praise, what, <clears throat> praise and worship is your weapon, but they got their direction from the Lord first. And that's the part of intercession that we're talking about. This is a weapon of warfare, praise and worship, but they went to God first. So praise is magnifying God's, God with our lips, but um, worship is, is really a condition of the heart. It does not have to be music, but a purposeful and intentional elevation of God above everything else. That's what worship is. <coughs> Excuse me. Four, the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God ex highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus said those who believe in his name would do mighty works. His name represents the summation of the authority of God. His name is the absolute above everything else, the devil and his demons are subject to the name of Jesus, the, the word says. So sometimes in intercession, um, maybe somebody's sick, and we'll, we'll speak out the name of Jesus is above cancer. You know, we'll say that because the word says that his name is above that. You know, cancer has no place above the name of Jesus. So if you're a child of God, anything that exalts itself higher than the name of Jesus, you are able to verbally, you know, set it below where it should be or to set Jesus' name above it so that it, you know, can be elevated above that whole situation. <coughs> Excuse me, you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to be sick in Jesus' name. <clears throat> okay, so five, Thanksgiving. 
Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and gratitude, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So it's very important that when we go into a warfare situation, we're just very thankful that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, that it's not even an asking. We, once we get direction, whether it's from the word or it's from of our time in prayer, then we should be thankful for the outcome. We should be in that position even when we enter into the battle. Seven, the cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus is the power and wisdom of, of God. Um, <clears throat> and that's in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 24. The cross was where the charges against us were wiped out. And the cross is an outstanding symbol of Satan's defeat. It is our symbol to look at. Um, and you know, a lot of Christians will talk about the cross and they're focused on the cross and that's a great weapon. We sometimes, when we get into things we feel are, are um, higher level or whatever, we tend to diminish the cross, you know, cause we're, we're at a different place, but the cross is like everything that is the total sum of what Jesus did. It's represented that we should probably never forget about the cross, you know, no matter what he's teaching us. It all goes back to that. The testimony. <clears throat> the testimony is our witness to the salvation of God in our lives. When we share our testimony, we become a personal lighthouse of hope so that others might overcome the power of the enemy and embrace God's truth and salvation. Um, <clears throat> testimony is a powerful weapon because it gives people the ability to see the result of what God's done in you. And I don't think we do that enough either. <clears throat> we don't give our testimony enough. We talk about the problem, I think, as a whole, more than we talk about what Jesus did. And um, even in, <clears throat> I've heard stories of heaven where people like may have had a, a sickness or something and it manifests, I think it was Bob Jones I was listening to, said it manifests in heaven once in a while because that's their testimony. The testimonies are very important, and the testimony is what did God get you out of? What did he redeem you from? What did he deliver you from? Those are all important things when you're even in prayer, when you're praying. <clears throat> Confession. Confession is proclaiming the truth of God's word in the face of opposition and trouble. It is elevating the truth of God's thought above the thoughts of doubt and unbelief that try to deny God's truth. When we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth the word of God, we will see the salvation of God. And there's scripture for that. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot that's come against confession because people go around just confessing whatever they want, you know, have name it and claim it. And you know what? If God says in his word, you can have it, you can have it and you can confess it. And the, the key to confession is believing it. If you're just confessing it, you have to confess and believe. <clears throat> so you got to get to that place of confessing God's word and what he says. If he's told you, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, everybody can have a new car or whatever. I'm gonna say, if he's told you that you can have something, then you can confess that thing. Know what the will of God is. The whole thing, this whole uh, thing has been about is knowing what God wants and then manifesting it in our lives and other people's. <clears throat> so confession, I mean, any kind of promise in the word of God, you can confess. I mean, and receive it, but you got to believe it. Prophesying. Prophesying is activating the revealed will of God by speaking forth the word of God through divine unction. Prophesying releases the potential of God in a situation. God's way... God's ways to speak forth his will and then bring to pass what he has spoken. So even prophecy can be, <clears throat> if you've been prophesied something and it bears witness with your, seer, your spirit, prophecy should always be, um, what's the word? Well, I'm sorry? It should always be edifying. Or it should always be confirmation to something God's already shown you. It shouldn't be a great surprise. You should, when you hear a prophetic word, it should already be in your heart. It's always confirmation and edifying. So if you know that to be true and God's confirmed it, <clears throat> you can confess that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. If you know it's the will of God, then let's pray it out. And then the last one is blessing. Blessing is speaking forth God's divine destiny and favor in people's lives. 
The power of blessing is in the tongue and it can set in motion the course of existence. We are called to bless and not curse. Very important in, um, in, uh, in um, oh my goodness, in praying, <laughs> in intercession. Um, because so many times we'll, you can be tempted to curse things a lot because there's things you don't like that you see, but we have to focus on God's a blesser. He wants people to prosper. He wants them to grow. He wants them to be blessed. And, um, and it's okay to, you know, curse the enemy, but it's not okay to curse people. You know, there's things in people's lives that need cursing, but we can't curse people. So, um, seen that done once in a while. So try to avoid that. <laughs> um, the armor of God, I, I'm not even going to go into that because I think you guys, I don't feel impressed to go into that at all, but you guys can read and you know about the armor of God. You've heard about that. <clears throat> so, all right. Basic understanding of spiritual warfare. Warfare is the result of an unresolved enemy conflict. When there's no enemy, there's no need for war. The Bible's clear that Lucifer is an, uh, or the devil is an ongoing war toward the saints of God, you and me, as our presence on the earth presents a direct threat to his rule of darkness in the lives of men. Um, I find it humbling to know that this demon Satan is scared of me. Like that the present, the power of God would be um, that much in my life, maybe you don't even feel it, but if you're a Christian, you have the spirit of God in you. That, that he would have to try to take me out or take you out, uh, you know, disarm you, make you sick, whatever it is, because you in you and you alone have the authority to rule over the earth and create blessings and, and uh, you know, just the will of God on the earth, fulfill the will of God on the earth. And um, it's just, it's very uh, interesting to me that just as people, you know, when you look at your natural self, but when you have God in you, you know, he's really scared of that. So, you know, I think that's kind of cool. Revelation 12, 9, Satan was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. We know that. And his, uh, Satan and his army of fallen angels are the forces that come against God and his plan of salvation for mankind. So ultimately, he doesn't want you to go to heaven. He wants to get back at God. So that's what he's going to try to do. He's going to try to grab as many people as he can, take them into darkness, and we're going to grab as many people as we can and take them into heaven. So um, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And I want to just point out this kingdom's very organized. Um, we just think there's like demons on your shoulder or they're in your, you know, they're just whispering you or whatever, but it's a very organized army. Um, God's army is very organized and Satan's army is very organized. As a matter of fact, um, there was a, a well-known prophetic voice that said she, uh, was it, um, I, I don't know, but she said that um, she went into a room and there were all these people strategizing and and um, she was shocked because it was demons and it was the Satan was creating strategies and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to come around here and and I think we forget that he's not a just a fly-by-night kind of enemy you know this is why we can't like go it alone I mean you can fight by yourself but some things you have to go with other people and you have to get together so that you hear the strategies of God because he's the only one who knows how to take these things out and he can take them out and he will take them out if he has people who pray so <clears throat> I want to just go over and this might not this may or may not be new to you but what those four things are principalities comes from the Greek word archas, A-R-C-H-A-S. And that describes the highest order. They're the delegated rulers assigned over geographical nations and regions. So there's demons on the upper level who are assigned over whole areas. Um, I heard once, this is years ago, but there was some kind of coup in, I believe it was the Red Square, or in China, I think it was. And, no, I know what happened. 
let me get this right, it was a long time ago. But they were showing how, if you look at history, demons can't be omnipresent, they can't be everywhere. And when the Berlin Wall came down, it was at the same time it was, the Lord had shown this person that the demonic forces had moved into that coup in, I believe it was China. So they had sort of gathered their forces and left that wall not as protect, you know, because they wanted the wall. Demons wanted that wall. And when they moved out, the wall was able to come down and Christians got the breakthrough. So um, I just thought that was fascinating because then they were showing different historical times that where things shifted because they can't be all at one place at one time. They have, they have assignments. And, you know, they're going to leave weak areas here and there. So we need to know the strategies of God so we know where those weak areas are so we can go in and hit them and take them down. Powers. It's the Greek word, and I don't know how to say it, exousias, E-X-O-U-S-I-A-S, and that means authorities. And they're delegated authorities in Satan's kingdom under the principalities. Number three, rulers of the darkness of this world. It's the Greek word kos, kosmokrataris, K-O-S-M-O dash K-R-A-T-O-R-A-S, and this or word rulers. It can be translated lord of this world and princes of this age. They are signed to cover this world in darkness in order to conceal the true knowledge of God and of salvation through Jesus Christ according to scripture. Philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. And that's 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and Colossians 2.8. Number four, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Hosts can also be translated armies. They work to twist man's behavior, thinking, and character uh, against the moral standard of God. Uh, God. They're the frontline demons. They're the ones you and me have to deal with regularly on a daily basis. <clears throat> and don't think they're not there. We don't like to focus on demonic activity. We want to focus on Jesus. But you have to know that there is a... a a warfare against you, you know, and know the, know the devices of your enemy, you know, the, you know, so that you can take care of it. So many times we think things just happen. Things don't just happen. Things are being planned and plotted against you. And like, cause I, I had a great friend when I lived in Florida and she was always talking about the devil here and the devil there and the devil here and the devil there. And, and she was a great spiritual warrior, but, but that's how, I mean, she lived without that joy of knowing Jesus and knowing victory. You know, she loved him, but there was so much focus on the enemy. And I think we need to learn to put the focus where it needs to be, you know, on God. But know, understand that there is an enemy at work. So what is an intercessor? In the Old Testament, the high priest stood in the gap between himself and his people. The highest priest ever was Jesus, whose death and resurrection provided a method of atonement, again, for sin once and for all. And since the death of Christ, Satan still has power. He's not powerless, but his legal authority based on our sin has been taken away. He does have power, but God's got more power. We have more power because God lives in us. Greater is he who lives in you than he who lives in the world. An intercessor is also one who stands in the gap for another. Ezekiel 22:30, and this is a very famous scripture, very well-known scripture, I should say. So I sought up for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. So God wants to save his people from destruction, but he must find someone who will stand in the gap and, and uh, plead for mercy. I mean, it just doesn't happen. He's where his vessels on the earth, he just doesn't come down and, and go, this is going to happen. He says, I want this to happen, but I need somebody to birth it into the earth. I mean, that's a very honorable job for us as Christians, that we're birthing the plans of God into the earth and the devices, the devices of God into the earth. So in this scripture, God couldn't save because of sin and the absence of an intercessor. That's a big deal. And the church doesn't pray. So why do we complain about what's going on in the world today when we don't pray? 
we have to pray. We have to speak God's will into the earth. We just have to. It's not, you know, there was a prophetic thing on the Elijah list. I gave it to you today. I don't know that you read it. But it says it's time for intercessors to rise up more than ever. We need to really start proclaiming the word of God. It's the, vo it's the year of speaking out. We need to do it. So are you willing to be that one? That's what we're asking in this class. Are you willing to be the one to stand in the gap and pay the price so that God can be fulfilled in the earth? Not, not necessarily your desires, but God's desires. You know, so many times we go into, into prayer and it's, God, I need this, I need that, I need, want this, I need that, I need a new car. I, my, I mean, we got, you know, a water, uh, we need a new air conditioning heater system, you know. I'm like, okay, God, but that's not, that's so not the priority. The priority is bringing his will to the earth and he says he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. If you're doing his will, not saying you don't ever ask, but he'll take care of you. You, you know, it's not, that's not the priority. He's going to take care of what I need. His word's very clear on that, and he's proved that to us over and over and over again. So, you know, we need to just be about the will of the Father like Jesus was. <clears throat> so I wanted to go over, and this is where I really felt that I needed to bring this up today. Um, the, the um, what's the word of, way of saying it, but intercession issues, why people don't intercede what are the blockages things like that so the number one fear is number one fear is number one second timothy 1 7 god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind so many people are afraid to intercede or do the work of god because of the devil's going to be on my back somebody's going to you know do something to me i'm going to get backlash you know what? You will. You will get backlash if you believe it. But you know what? If you believe God's called you and you're doing what he's called you to do, then guess what? The devil has nothing on you. You're protected. You're safe. So in Matthew 28, 18, he said he delegated his authority to every believer. If you receive Jesus, you have God's authority. In Luke 10, 19, it says that nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing nothing we, we need to say that like 10 times nothing will hurt me nothing will hurt me we need to understand who we are go ahead yeah Mm-hmm. There's the message for today. <laughs> but he does say nothing shall harm us. So it <clears throat> but they were doing the will of the Father for that moment. I mean if God, you know, once again we need to understand what God's telling us to do. Don't step outside our boundaries. Know what he's telling you to do, do it and believe he's gonna protect you. When we were going, um, my kids went on missions trips, and um, my mom was very anxious about sending them to the Darien jungle and this. <laughs> and, um, you know, I said, Mom, the safest place my children could be is where God's called them to be. If they're called to go in the middle of the Darien jungle, they're safer there than our backyard. Felt the same way about when we went to Israel during the war. If God called us there and we knew it, He's going to protect us there. He's not going to protect me on the streets of Cologne Avenue. He's going to collect me, uh, protect me on the streets of, of uh, wherever we were, you know, because he called us there. He'll protect you wherever he's called you. 
So God has given us both authority and power over the enemy. We don't have to fear the power of the enemy as long as we operate within the boundaries of the authority and power that God has given us. It's not a free for all. You have to understand your boundaries. We know as a church, we have a, the Lord has told us we have a 50 mile uh, realm radius of authority. He's, he spoke that to us and then sent two prophets to confirm it. We know what we have as a church when we pray. So anything that happens in that 50 miles, and we got the ocean too, there's water spirits we've come against and stuff, but we know that we can sit there and believe God's going to protect us in the middle of that 50 mile radius. So, you know, no, ask them what you're, you know, I, I just had, um, I just had a cousin, a cousin's child get murdered last this week. And um, it was very heart wrenching to me because it's, you know, part of the family. And um, I said, well, God, you know, why didn't I have that unction to pray for them? And he said, it wasn't your realm of authority. You know, and I thought, okay, you know, but you still deal with that guilt. Like, why didn't I wake up in the middle of the night? Why didn't I cover him? Why didn't I, you know, I didn't even hardly know the kid, but still. And we, you know, there's, there's comfort in knowing God's given you a certain realm of authority, and that's your responsibility. Your families are your authority. You know, anybody that's in your family, you have authority over. If they're in your family, like your immediate family, you, you have the right to demand things back from the devil for them. And you have the right to expect God to do certain things in their life. But that's just an example. So... To know that you're in God's will and then you walk in that is, is protection. But if something happens when you're doing that, um, and we can push back. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. Say, God, you know, I was doing your will. This is, this is, I'm right yeah. I'm in the right place. You, you know, I, I'm counting. Absolutely. I mean, we're led by, by peace. And I like, you know, Pastor Garth has always said, don't listen to the fanatic in the attic, listen to the fellow in the cellar. God leads us by peace. He, he draws us by his spirit. We're going to know here rather than here. So when you know here, you'll know. Right. We were at, we were at doing things for the church. We were doing all this stuff, my husband and I, on Sunday. We left the church, went to get a newspaper. We were in our arm down. And um, I was shook because I, I, I the only hours later because I realized I didn't pray. I was I was in peace because we weren't hurt, or, you know. But I thought I didn't pray right at that moment. I, that was my time to say, God, you know, I'm calling. I'm calling you on this one. And um, that that's what I want. I want to be. So in tune. Of praying, praying. Don't get thrown off. Like, whoa, what the heck just happened right. here? You know? And I think, no, no, no. and I think we need to do that. And I know times in my life, and I'm sure we all do, when you you know that you missed it. We all miss it. But you know what? He says he'll take care of even that. Yeah. You know what? So that's that's the beauty. You repent and you move on, and you say, God, next time I'm going to just try to hear your voice clearer and, and do what He says to do. I mean, nobody is perfect except for Jesus. And we're all growing in, in, you know, knowing about God. And from what I understand, in heaven, we're still going to be learning about God. So nobody's going to know it all. You know, we're still in a process of being renewed all the time. So, um, yeah, so I just, when things like that happen, you know, it's just, you know, get rid of the spirit of trauma and move on. You know, that thing can bind you, the guilt and condemnation and all that. That just needs to go. Okay, so I didn't pray. Thank you for a new car. Thank you for fixing the car. Whatever. You know, thank you. Nobody was hurt. I mean, it could have been so much worse. I mean, right. it could have been an attack of the enemy meant to take you out and you were protected. Right. You know, because of your daily prayer, your daily time with God. You know, maybe that specific time you didn't cover it, but you've been covering yourself for a while, hopefully. You know, so God's going to protect you anyway. It's a car. I mean, not to diminish what happened, but, yeah. but really, it's not your life. Right. So praise God for that. But I just want to get, I want to get better. To hear the voice. Right. And 
immediately. Yeah. Some trauma happens, I don't want to question. You know, like question, was, well, was I in the wrong place? Did I do something But wrong? there's always an enemy out there looking for every little crack. You know, so things happen. They do. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when we're praying in the spirit, we don't know who we're praying for. We really don't a lot of the time. You know, I know he gives us interpretation sometimes, but sometimes we're just praying and trusting that whatever we're praying out is his will. And it could be, you know, people will meet in heaven one day and he'll say, you prayed for them. And we'll go, oh, that's nice, you know. Um, we don't know. So anyway, so um, fear, we have to get rid of the fear. So we must conquer fear with faith, conquer fear with faith. It says the fight is for our faith. That's our fight, really. Satan's been defeated. Our, our, <clears throat> and then I heard somebody say a long time ago, fear is the opposite of faith. If you're not, if you're not in faith, you're in fear about something. And you can, you can call it whatever you want, but it's fear. If you, you know, that's the bottom line. So if you're struggling with anything and it's not in faith of what God says and his promises, then you're in fear and you need to get rid of it. <clears throat> Authority is number two. So this is a, a toughie because, um, not a toughie, it's, it's not a very well received section because there's a lot of authority issues in the church. So I'm gonna say this as nicely as I can, but I think everybody, everybody needs to hear this because the body of Christ is out of order as a whole and i'm going to read this to try to say <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> mature intercessors understand that god alone has all divine authority and delegates his authority to whomever he wishes therefore they do not struggle against god's delegation process but honor those he has delegated as his agents and representatives in the earth i'm just going to jump in right here and say i have seen so many people struggling to move ahead and get positions. And I don't think people fully understand what goes with the position. Like I would rather clean the toilets and vacuum the church, really. I would love to just be an intercessor. I don't want to be up here in front of you talking, but God delegates authority to whom he delegates it to. And I'm not saying that to say I'm higher than because we're all equal. It's just a position. It's a position. I'm called a pastor. You may not be. You may be. You may be called a prophet. You may be called. It's their positional things. They're not any less important in the body of Christ. But <clears throat> there's so much competition in the body. And it's, it's really sad. It's, just, it's almost like just get in your lane and stay in it and do what God want you to do because when there's all this competition for prestige and whatever it, it just um it just it just destroys the body of christ it, it, and we can't function as a body because god has called pastor steve to be a pastor he's called apostle josh to be an apostle he's called um leaders he's called we, are, we all have a part in the body of Christ and a title does not mean anything to God it's just a position or a job description so the competition really needs to end and um, so anyway delegated authority is always given with express parameters and boundaries knowing your God ordained boundaries is vital in intercession and spiritual warfare if you're out of order God cannot use you I'm just going to say that again. If you're out of order, God cannot use you. And that doesn't mean you're less than. But he set up, God is a very organized God. And when we walk into the church and we act however we want and we do whatever we want without the blessings of the authority above us, it's not going to, not, the spirit of God's just not going to move. There has to be, um, uh, there has to be order. And then we let the Holy Spirit flow and do what he wants but we have to be willing vessels to do or not do whatever God tells us to. Um, so we seek the Lord for divine strategy, timing, and specific authorization in spiritual warfare. And then we're talking about entering into battles God has not assigned us to is presumptuous and dangerous. Know, 
<clears throat> if you're going ob over not so much your daily life demons, but the higher level ones, know that you're called to do that before you enter in. Get yourself prayed up and prepared. So what happens is um, there's this spirit of pride that's in the church right now. <clears throat> and because of the high level, of, and I'm talking just to intercessors here, okay? Because of the high level of spiritual activity and revelation received during intercession, intercessors, who is really everybody, who is actually interceding, must be on the alert for the development of spiritual pride in their heart. Intercessors must understand that everyone is called to the ministry of intercession and there is no official gift of intercessor mentioned in the Bible. Um, and I don't know that this is a problem in this church, but I've seen it in other churches where I'm intercessor so-and-so and I'm intercessor so-and-so. Well, everybody is an intercessor and everybody should be interceding. It's not a title. It's, it's, not, it's something God has called all of us to. It's not special. And there's places where people elevate that title to a position of authority. And it is, you do have authority because God's given it to you, but it's not authority in the church. Those are different gifts. <clears throat> so I might not be speaking to any of you. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody here. So intercessors must avoid the temptation to elevate this ministry above what God ordained it to be. And it is a ministry of the priesthood to all believers. It's a ministry rather than an office. Pride's absolutely dangerous. Familiarity with the anointing and presence of God has a way of making us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. It's like being chosen by a king to be one of the service, servants in his house. At first, we're in awe of this privilege and our new surrounding because we're getting stuff from heaven when we're interceding. <clears throat> then we think we're all spiritual and stuff. <laughs> so, um, but once inside, we notice others who have more honorable, honorable positions. Once in a while, we can become desensitized to the great privilege. To be an intercessor is a privilege we have entered into as we begin to reset our lowly place. Rather than being promoted, the king will set us aside for a new servant who is grateful for the opportunity to serve in the house. So, <clears throat> you know, my thought, and I think it's God's thought, I think intercession is one of the most lowly, humbling things that you can do that will get the biggest reward in heaven. It's not gonna be a title. It's gonna be how you fell on your face before God and sought him and did the will of the Father. So I think, you know, where the Bible says the first shall be last and all, or the last shall be first and all those things. I think that um, titles mean nothing to God. I think getting on your face before him as an intercessor is the biggest thing you can do. You know, um, <clears throat> there's, just a, there's just a dying to self that goes with intercession because it's not about you. Like Dana said, it's not about you. You're going into the Father um, to seek his will on more so other people because you're trusting that the Father's taking care of you. <clears throat> so intercessors are warriors in the spirit realm. They must be aware of the domain they be given and not seek to lift themselves up beyond their calling. So this is, I thought this was good. Intercessors may see into the spirit realm, but this does not make them prophets. They may battle principalities and powers, but this does not make them apostles. They may see what God wants to do in the church, but this does not make them pastors. Those who operate in the spirit realm must not assume more than what God has given into their hand. So I don't, like I said, it may not be talking to anybody here, but it's not, the bottom line is it's not a um, office. It is a thing that we're all called to do and it's the most important thing we're probably all called to do besides lead people to the Lord you know so um, anyway so David said in Psalm 16 5 to 6 O Lord you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup you maintain my lot the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places yes I have a good inheritance so David was satisfied with the parameters that God gave him that's why he had victory because he stayed within his lane if you remember nothing else, stay in your lane. <laughs> do what God's called you to do, and don't worry about what everybody else is doing or not doing. So, <clears throat> so anyway, does that make sense? I didn't offend anybody, right? Okay. <clears throat> so the fourth one is accountability. Intercessors are prime targets for the devil, as you probably have already found out if you intercede at all. 
Many have been shipwrecked and led astray, and this could all be avoided if they'd let themselves be accountable. Say accountable. Everybody needs to be under somebody and listening to them. Everybody should have somebody that they're accountable to. And that means not your best friend. That means somebody who has a higher level of authority than you. There should always be somebody that's hearing the Lord in your behalf. To just to make, to confirm, correct, you know, and keep you on the right path. You should always have somebody. Intercessors can spend so, now this has, I've seen this happen, okay? So this is all a warning. <clears throat> Intercessors can spend so much time in the spirit realm that they lose all sense of God's wisdom in the natural realm. Um, my husband likes to call them kites without a string. They're out there floating around with nothing to hold on to. We should be grounded by the word. It's all good. All the supernatural gifts are awesome, but we should be grounded by the word. Without proper accountability, and that's what your accountability person above you, which would probably be your pastors here, um, intercessors can get flaky and out of touch. They often need a higher and higher goosebump level in order to be fulfilled. If greater spiritual highs become the focused, focus, things can go into a downward spiral quickly. Without accountability, intercessors can begin to feel that they are above natural duties, such as cleaning the church, servicing in the nursery, and helping others in need. Nothing matters anymore but prayer, which sounds all good and well. Who doesn't want to be just about prayer and the work of the Father? But they begin to feel that there's not such things as fun activities. God wants you to have fun too. He's put you on the earth not just to spend 24 seven in prayer, but to enjoy life. You know, there's a balance. So we need to understand the balance because everything, some people think needs to be super spiritual. And I know that you've all met people like this. So it's so, you know, you're, you're not spiritual enough, you know, because you laugh or whatever. And, um, and it's really sad because God wants us to, to live on this earth and enjoy life He's given us life to enjoy it, but also there's a purpose uh, at the same time that we have to we have to understand the times and the seasons, what we're supposed to doing be doing at what time. Sometimes we need to be in intercession. Sometimes we need to be having fun, you know. So he says, "Laughter do with good like a medicine." Maybe maybe we need a little more of that so we don't have to go to the doctor. Okay, so um, they're not fun. They feel that anything organized must be unspiritual. Unspir uh, yeah, unspiritual. They begin to think others rather than they are out of touch. And as a result, they can judge others as unspiritual and begin isolating themselves. And they stop receiving input or correction from their leadership because they know more about what is going on in the spirit realm. This can lead to deeper and deeper digression into deception and depression often occurs as they feel rejected by the pastor and those in the church. I've seen it happen. I'm sure you all have. And it's been, a, you know, just a slow kind of thing where then they isolate themselves and now, now they're like, you know, on the wild uh, plains of Africa, the herd is out here and they're at the back. So when, you know, the devourer comes, he, he can pick them out. So um, the end of this spiral equals Proverbs 30, oh no, no, Proverbs 18.1. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and he rage, rages against all wise judgment. They become to where they lack judgment. They started out as, oh, okay, we're done for the moment. Okay, so number five is going to be your flesh. It's one of the uh, problems with intercession that could be become a problem with the intercession. Casualties in the area of intercession and spiritual warfare can be caused by smoke screening the works of the flesh behind a cloak of spirituality. Rather than saying I was wrong, we choose to hide behind a facade, a fa facade, facade. That's terrible, facade. <laughs> Another new word. <laughs> Facade. Oh boy. <laughs> of being <laughs> okay. <laughs> of being under attack by the devil or I'm being targeted by people under the control of evil spirits. So lesson one, flesh is not removed by spiritual warfare. 
It is removed by crucifying it. You hang it on the cross and leave it there. And if you're not something, what's a way of putting this? Don't fake it. If you don't know, you don't know. If you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the knowledge. If you didn't hear from God, you didn't hear from God. I mean, just don't fake it. If, if, I mean, there's times in, in intercession where I'll get nothing. And then there's times where the Lord's just constantly talking and saying stuff. I'm not going to just because I'm one of the pastors feel like I need to stand up there and say something if God didn't say it. If it's five weeks in a row, then don't say it. If God doesn't give you anything, just stay mute. He'll give you something at some point. I mean, it's, it's just people sometimes feel like they have to do something and they work it up in their flesh and then it's not God and it's not going to do anything anyway. <clears throat> so when we get rid of the flesh, we automatically get rid of the demons that feed on the flesh. And we must humble our pride and die to the will of the flesh if we're going to avoid the devil having us for lunch. So it's very important that we do things under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness is number six. We cannot intercede sincerely for those we have not forgiven in our heart. And this isn't in here, but the Lord says, if you haven't forgiven somebody else, he's not even going to hear your prayers, it says in the word. So we need to always walk in forgiveness if we're going to be praying. So why bother if we're not in forgiveness? Um, so Pastor Garth has a saying, we pray, we pray for what we care for and we learn to pray. No, I got it wrong. <laughs> we... What is it? We pray for what we care for, but we learn to care for what we pray for. So if you don't care for something or someone, pray for them. It says to pray for our enemies. And if we and if we do care for something, you know, then that's what we should pray for. I mean, so we should always be praying basically you know in the right heart for whether we like it or like something or not we should be praying for that situation forgiveness is an area where intercessors must excel and the reason being because we need god to hear our prayers if there's unforgiveness intercessors may feel tempted to pray judgment rather than mercy seen that intercessors must ensure that the beam of judgment in their own eye has been removed before attempting to remove the splinter from the eyes of whom they intercede it's big it's big we need to check yourself before you get into intercession you know how they, like when we take communion we we ask the lord to reveal to us and get ourselves right we need to do that before we begin interceding on that level that we want to take down principalities and strongholds we're not going to have any kind of any kind of victory in that if we're not in forgiveness <clears throat> we're never really able to intercede for those we are not willing to die for hey i'm going to say that again we are never really able to intercede for those we're not willing to die for that's a mouthful that's a, something to strive for you know are we willing to die for our brother? Yeah. We need to ask God for a revelation of his love for those whom we pray for. Um, seven, we touched on before, competitive jealousy. We must remember we're not competing against one another and we'll each stand as an individual in our own race. We should not be comparing ourselves to one another, but comparing how we measure to Jesus. Competitive jealousy enters when individuals get their eyes off Jesus and start looking at each other. It always undermines unity and the army of God in response will be weakened. Number eight, unity and intercession. We must understand we're not lone rangers, but part of a team. I know you will probably all know the lone ranger too. The person that hears everything, knows everything, sees everything, and nobody else knows as much as they do. Well, the bottom line is we prophesy in part. We hear in part. We need others to fill in the gaps. Um, there's, you know, you may get a word that's in total, but for the most part, God's works in teams. He wants the body of Christ to be a family. He wants us unified. He wants us together. He wants us working together. 
God's bringing forth his army in these last days because armies are raised up to possess territories. This is bigger stuff we're going after. We're not just going after a lost soul. We're going after cities. We're going after nations. We're, you know, we're, we want to take the entire world to heaven with us. You know, if you're limited to one person, you're missing the will of God because God wants to take entire cities, entire, entire states. So, I mean, if you're there, you're there. That's fine. But there is a bigger vision out there. <clears throat> Unity and interdependence in the army of God are key elements involved in taking cities, regions, and nations. Matthew 12, 25 says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided itself will not stand. So it's very important we're in unity at least, at least with the people in our church so that we can be on one, one mind, one vision, one calling. It's important we stand together as one. Okay, number nine, witchcraft in intercession. Um, we tend to think of witchcraft as something only those serving the devil do, but it's very prevalent in the church today. People unknowingly perform witchcraft every day. And witchcraft is an attempt to control others in any of three ways, intimidation, manipulation, and domination. And I'm going to say this, women are very good at this and have tendency to do it. We all have done it to some degree. I stand here and say without even, like you look back and you go, oh, you know, I said this to make him think one way so we would do this. Women are very, you know, there's a, there's a mind that's different from a man. I saw once a scientist said men pull a drawer out and they close it. They pull a drawer out and they close it. Women are like, we're always thinking of the way to get our way. We're always, I mean, you may not realize it, but that's the way our minds work, and the devil uses that. So when I say witchcraft is anything we do to control and get our way, if we manipulate to get our way, that's whip, witchcraft. So within the church, true intercessors pray, and I'm going to talk about the church. True intercessors pray in line with the vision of the house. Every house has a different vision. If, if your church is called to a certain thing, then that's, as intercessors, when you're praying for the church and your church is called to having an apostolic center, you shouldn't be praying that they're doing community outreach somewhere if that's not what they're, I mean, not saying they can't do that, but when the primary focus is, and like Pastor Steve and Josh have told you, this is what the calling of our church is, you should be staying within those parameters unless, not what you want, but what the, you know, when you're praying for the church, you need to pray what the head has said. That's where an authority piece comes in. <clears throat> so they are not interested in praying their own vision. Two different visions create division, two visions. They ask the leadership of the house to share their vision and they go into prayer like Joshua and her to hold up the hands of those who hold up the rod of God. So your pastors are holding up the vision and our job is to intercede and create that vision to go forth, you know, and ask the Lord to bless it and, and not something that's outside of that vision. Um, at different times, we've had people come into the church and get very upset because we're not doing something or they didn't like this. And, and you know, basically our response, because we're not, we're kingdom minded, we're not about keeping people, <laughs> you know, we want you in the place that God has you. And, um, you know, it's, it's like then maybe this isn't the house for you. And that's fine. You know, find out, go to a place where you can line up with their vision, fall into that thing, and move together as one. If it's not the vision that you're called to, then maybe you need to look elsewhere. You need to be able to follow that ship. Um, we often, <clears throat> I don't know, this is just our way of thinking is that leadership in the church has always kind of been like this, like a triangle, and the pastor's always been at the top, but God's changing that. It's about the body of Christ, it's still a position, but we always look at it as the triangle is now tipped. You know, like we're leading the path, but everybody's still on that equal plane. You know what I mean? And it's just, um, it's not like, you still have the authority, but it's different. It's not, you're not lauding over the people, you're, 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 fueling the vision that's what we're doing fueling the vision that god's given for the champion's house it's kind of like Moses the yeah and if you can't grab onto that vision there are plenty of other churches out there you want to be a blessing to the house that you're at 
so witchcraft prayer, on the other hand, sets ambushes against the leadership of the house, and it's done in the name of what God would have. Oh, they just don't understand what God wants them to do here. And, you know, well, if, if your, your pastors or apostles have not said that, that they're doing it, then you probably shouldn't be praying it and before asking the Lord, you know, and talking to them about it. So I keep looking at you, but I'm not judging you or anything. I'm not, <laughs> just, I just, you know, I don't know, maybe I should do this. <laughs> it's not meant to be directed at you, just so you know. Um, we also see it in personal prayer a lot when good-meaning people pray for situations to happen that aren't directed from the throne of heaven and have seen it cause disappointment and decreased faith in God in the people being prayed for. For instance, um, yeah, you know, I told her that God was going to sell this house for her and never sought the Lord. Just wouldn't God do that because he's a good God? Never asking the Lord what his plan is. Sometimes, sometimes, well, I'll tell you a little story real quick. My sister-in-law <clears throat> was on psych meds, Garth, Pastor Garth's sister, psych meds, diagnosed with like 10 different diseases, Lyme's, glaucoma, some cancer, just not really right in, in the head, lost a bunch of jobs, just not together at all. She lost her house. She ended up living in a shed for a winter. And um, we never felt impressed to help her. And people are like, oh, that's your sister-in-law. Never felt impressed. I think we bought her a coffee one time. She lived on peanut butter in a shed with a little space heater for a year, no, a whole winter with nine dogs, I think, or something. I don't know. So <clears throat> out of that time with the Lord, because it made her seek God, she got off all her meds, healed of every disease, is a professor at a college now, and got married all within a year's time. And she will tell you that if we had helped her, she would not have gotten the results that she needed to get from the Lord. So it's not always rushing to enable people. It's seeking the Lord for what his will is so he can do what he needs to do. Um, then there's times, you know, somebody will come in and God puts it right on your heart. Help them. Give them $300. Give them food. Give them whatever. You do what the Lord says because he knows the whole situation. What we see on the outside is not always what's going on in the inside. So we need to seek the will of God in everything before we start to pray for it, whether it's our family or the church or anything greater. So God has a plan. Know his plan before you pray it. Otherwise, you may be operating in witchcraft because then you're praying out your plan, and that's dangerous. All right, so one more thing I want to go over. Three levels of spiritual warfare. Okay, so we've got ground-level warfare, Luke 10:17 through 29, and Mark 16, 15 through 20. This is the level... I know. <laughs> <laughs> Luke 10, 17 through 29, Mark 16, 15 through 20. And this is the level that we wage war through salvation, repentance, and casting out demons. Every believer has authority and power to operate on this level in setting people free. Casualties among saints in this area are usually minimal, and a lot depends upon a person's right standing with God, their maturity, and their faith level. So this is like our daily warfare. You know, you know, the, as the enemy's attacking us, we're just moving on with God and taking care of him as we go on our way. <clears throat> Number two is the occult level warfare. Second Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. <laughs> James 3. At this level, demons are activated against us through words or curses. We're people. It's through people, we're speaking spirits. God has made us speaking spirits. And when we open our mouth, we're either blessing or cursing. Nothing's really neutral. We need to be aware. And when we send out something that's negative, which we all have done, and we complain about something, we are actually cursing something. And we have to be aware that our words are powerful, negative or positive. 
that's where um, the Lord's been dealing with me lately is make sure your words, that you're only speaking positive things over people. And it's a weird situation when you have authority over some things and you, you need to take care of some issues, but you want to be, uh, but it says to speak the truth in love. And if it's love, it's going to be okay. You know, but we can't be complaining and cursing people because that's exactly what we're doing. We're just cursing people and we're going to stand accountable for that one day. So that's just, that's even beyond spiritual warfare. All right, so curses release the voice of demons to begin speaking in our minds and in our ears. Blessing changes the inner voices. Every believer has the ability and authority to release God's word and blessing in order to see people set free from this level of demonic activity. Casualties in this area can be avoided by staying free from offense. Free from offense. That's increasing in the end times, you know. Stay free from offense, bitterness, rebellion, and pride. The heart and mind are the chief battlegrounds in this level of warfare, and the tongue is the chief weapon. The tongue is the chief weapon. So watch what you say every moment, every day. Hey, I did a wrong. <laughs> He's good at that. I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> so level three, territorial level warfare, Daniel 10, Mark 5, 10. This level of spiritual warfare is over geographical neighborhoods, cities, counties, regions, states, and nations. This level of warfare engages principalities and powers that directly influence and control lives in that region, both in the political and religious realm. These demonic forces do not usually go away, but they can become weaker. While believers have authority over these powers, territorial spirits have deep-seated roots in the sins of the forefathers. Um, you know, you hear a lot about digging wells. Um, you know, when we, we're in Egg Harbor City, I don't live there, but that's where our church is. And, you know, the Lord's basically commissioned us to take back the city. And we've seen through the intercession, dealing with water spirits, possessing the land, doing what God said to do, interceding, staking the ground, evolving. Um, we've seen the tide turn over the last few years. But it's, it's, that's what we're confronting here. We're confronting, you know, a spirit of anti-Semitism, um, you know, very German city. We're confronting these water spirits that have seated themselves in these uh, new age kind of things that started back in the 1900s where, you know, the Lord's revealed to us what the, the things that we're confronting, you know, the, the religious spirit, you know, and we, we're confronting it in intercession the way he tells us to, but there's also been not just intercession, but prophetic acts that have gone along with that. So the intercession is getting the direction of the Lord praying out what he wants, hearing what he wants, and then doing it, you know, so, so it's not just about praying, it's about sometimes doing also. So while uh, believers have authority over these powers, territorial spirits have deep-seated roots, they are best dealt with by um, armies of saints. It's not something you want to take out on the, you know, Egg Harbor Township, you want to go into prayer in your prayer closet and find out what the demons are there and try to take them out by yourself. That's a group group effort, you know, where one put a thousand to flight, two ten thousand, and it multiplies. You need, those are things that you just need to use wisdom in and, and gather believers with you because you're not coming in. It's one little demon whispering in your ear. <clears throat> in this type of warfare, rank and file unity within the army and strategic operation in the army seem to be of great importance in order to avoid unnecessary casualties of warfare. At this level, all all binding and loosing spiritual activity must, must be orchestrated from the, fr the throne of God. It can't be assumed at that level. You'll get beat up in a heartbeat. You have to hear what God wants to do. You have to say what God wants to do. You're, you're not coming against, like I said, one. You're coming against a host. And you, you, just, you, have, you do have authority. I don't want to say you can't do it. But you, you need to be prepared. You need to go in, you know, knowing who you are, first of all. If you don't know who you are, then you're probably not all beat there. And that's the fact that you'll win and that you're hearing God. Yes? Um, what you were saying about your need to use you know, wisdom and know when to say and not because I have a lot of activity in my home with the nurses coming in and out. So I'm always watchful who's touching my husband, who's coming. And one time, this lady, this nurse walked in. 
day. And my spirit was like this. And he said, oh, Lord. I said, what was that? And he said, this one you can't handle. I forgot how he said it. But I was like, this one you can't um, handle by yourself. You know, he was like, don't go into warfare by yourself. With the, he's like, you can't do this one alone. Like she was the top witch. I said, no. Oh. Who sent her here? You know, like that. But she wasn't there. She was sent there for deliverance. Mm. You know, to start the healing process to plant for me to plant the seed. Mm -hmm. But I listened to the Lord and I just waited and I watched. I wasn't. I didn't feel scared. I had no fear because I knew who I am. Mm -hmm. So I would anoint my husband and anoint his bed and anything she touched. She didn't now. And then um, I listened to her story and it came from bitterness from a mm -hmm. relationship that she never uh, healed from. Mm -hmm. And you, there's a door somewhere. These people don't wake up and be like that. There's something that happens. Right, and you were smart to ask the Lord what to do because yeah. it may mean praying for her, getting, being a part of, and even maybe seeing her delivered, but it may mean calling up the agency and saying, I'm just not comfortable with this person. Oh, but right, that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's why we have to know. Yeah. It's not wrong to do that. Yeah. It's just not wrong to do that. Yeah. So, but if you feel, but you can also be instrumental in their life yeah. too. So... And I want to just point out right there, that woman has just become in her, her realm of authority. Right there. By walking into her house, she now has authority over that situation, at least in her house, to see her come to know the Lord. God puts people in our lives for different reasons. Sometimes you got to just say go, and sometimes he puts them in, and you, that, then they're part of your realm of authority. You, you can do what God tells you to do with them because he's got a plan. And you might not be the total answer, but you might be a, a big piece, you know, a seed. I mean, I, and that's the beauty of God. He says he gives the same reward to the one who sows plants and waters. I mean, whether you see them ultimately come to salvation or not, if you had a part, that's amazing. You get the same reward. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Can you imagine how many rewards you have in store for you that you don't even know because you've never seen the fruit of your labors, but really there is fruit that you haven't seen yet? So anyway, so territory warfare, um, we could, went through that. Uh, revelation from the throne, and this is probably the last thing I'm going to go over. <clears throat> um, the intercessor must be careful where they receive their revelation for prayer. The first heaven revelation, Genesis 1, I think it's 132, I have a typo. Nat is the natural atmosphere or your sense knowledge? What you can see, hear, and feel here. If we only use our five senses, it can lead to inaccurate intercession. We cannot make judgments about individuals or situations based on the outward appearance only. For God only knows the heart. It is from the knowledge gained from this realm that we recognize the need for food, clothing, shelter, healing, provision, physical strength, and peace. We see people's needs. It's pretty obvious sometimes. You know, we'll say to that person, oh, you look, you know, I'm going to pray for strength for you because they look tired. You know, and that's not necessarily wrong, but that's not the level we should be staying at. We should be seeking the Lord beyond that. We should be seeing spirit to spirit, not with our eyes and ears only. So <clears throat> we will not get the results if we pray solely on the basis of need. We won't get those results that God wants because Jesus was not simply moved by need. We know he wasn't moved. There was lots of needs and he wasn't moved. He was moved by faith and by what he saw his father doing. That's why we should always be, what, if I, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you see in this person? And um, you know, I've had that prayer for a long time. You know, let me not look at the, the exterior, exterior of people. You know, let me see what Jesus sees. And it's so hard because this is what you, as a person, you know, this is our realm. So, but we need to learn to get past that. 
The second heaven revelation is Ephesians 6.12. It's a realm in which demonic spirits operate. This type of revelation received in this realm comes through the demonic realm. Because we are spiritual beings, have the ability to detect or discern demonic or evil influences at work around us. But because we detect and discern this negative information does not mean we are to act on the basis of that information. Anyone can see the negative and attack it with criticism and judgment. For instance, James and John discerned the negative spiritual attitude of the Samaritans, and they concluded that they would be respond by calling down the fire of God. But Jesus revealed they were operating in the wrong spirit. What they discerned was true, but the response was wrong. He proceeded to give them a higher revelation, that is, he did not come to destroy but to save. Although this type of revelation may give us insight into what the enemy is doing, it must not become the basis of our direction and intercession. And you see this a lot. <clears throat> um, different prophetic words, you know, destructions come into the United States, blah, blah, blah. You know, you see, you see just as many destruction and the, and the judgment of God on the United States as God's going to bless this country. He's got blessings in store for us. Well, I don't see that judgment. If I pray, I don't see that. I see it coming someday if we don't turn around. But right now I see blessings. That's all I see when I pray is that God's going to bless this country. So when people operate in that in second realm, they're seeing the negative. They're seeing what Satan wants to do. They're ne they just haven't gotten up higher yet to see what God wants to do. I mean, and there is times that God will reveal judgment and things like that, but I'm just saying you have to be very discerning what's coming at you. So the third heavenly revelation, for, uh, 2 Corinthians blah, 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 <clears throat> Second Corinthians 12.2 and Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. And this is the heaven in which God lives. It is here that we can approach the throne of God, the revelation we receive from this realm is given by the Holy Spirit. It's at this level that we can discover God's eternal perspective and his perfect will. It's a place that Jesus, our intercessor, is interceding for us. He does that in this realm. And intercession is always initiated from this realm. Always, 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 always. So if you're not at the point where you're here in heaven, then you need to press in. You just need to hear what God's saying. We must partner with his intercessions. We are not to pray what originates in our own heart, but come before his throne and pray until the Holy Spirit reveals what is on his heart to pray. When you see us all praying in the spirit, like, I don't know, I've been to a couple of your prayer meetings, but a little different than ours. We'll pray in the spirit a lot till we get the will of the Father on something, and then we'll speak it out. Um, there are things that we'll pray for that are just natural things, but truly when we're dealing with intercession and principalities, we need to spend time in the spirit hearing from the Father before we start to pray these things out in understanding. So <clears throat> in this realm, God reveals his intended destiny and plan for an individual or people. From this realm, we see beyond the natural and the demonic, and we see people as God sees people. From this realm, it is clearly seen who is the enemy and who is the victim. From this realm, we see the sacrifice of Jesus and the end from the beginning. This is the realm where vision is clear and love prevails. Our intercession and spiritual warfare must be initiated and sustained from the third heaven. Therefore, we are not to impose our ideas upon this earth, but to enter into the throne room in worship and prayer until the Lord reveals his will. Then we can pray in agreement with him and see heaven on earth. That's our desire anyway. So, <clears throat> let me see. As saints, we're fight, uh, we fight with our spiritual weapons from a spiritual position. Uh, he positioned us for battle. He says in Ephesians 2, 6, God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We sit with Jesus, we reign from that, we pray from that, we rule from that. Um, our positions now, uh, Ephesians 1, 9 through, blah, 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 1, 19 through 23, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his might, power, 
which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is names, not only in this age, but also what is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So when we're praying in our heavenly language, we're activating that heavenly place that we're seated with him. We're in that spot that we're with Jesus and he's interceding for us and we're hearing what he's saying, you know, and we're going to speak it out on the earth. So in conclusion for this part, as believers and intercessors, it's a great honor to be entrusted and del as delegated authority as Christ ambassadors in this earth. We have the authority and power to conquer Satan on any level as the Lord directs. I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, you can't take down that or you can't do this. You can if the Lord directs you how to do it. And um, Jesus already defeated the enemy. He's a defeated foe. We only need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and be obedient soldiers in his army doing what, where, and when he says to do it, timing's everything, positioning's everything, and with them we'll see victory in our lives and the lives of those around us. So that's it for me. To go to, well, first go to uh, Hebrew, no, Romans 8. I want to really, obviously we don't have a lot of time, and I don't want to belabor the point. Romans 8. Um, Initially, we want to say this, is that um, uh, God's Word tells us that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He is also the head intercessor. The spirit of prophecy, that's important to understand that because uh, where the spirit is, there's liberty, liberty in Christ. And that what I was saying this is that in all things that we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Um, intercession is as unto the Lord. Uh, when we prophesy, when a spirit of prophecy begins to move, it's based on the scripture I referenced to, it's because Jesus is being glorified. He's the head. He's the head of the table. He's the chief shepherd and so on. So when we intercede, it's important to know that we're interceding um, not only, uh, well, let me say it this way. We're interceding because he is the lead intercessor. So it's important to have a heart of worship, as my wife had mentioned, um, to seek him out first, to let him lead us in intercession through Holy Spirit, amen, and know that we're always subject to his leadership. And I want to read 834 of, of uh, Romans. I didn't get there. Uh, Eight thirty-four. Okay. Um, who is he who condemns us? It is Christ who died, or the Anointed One, who died, and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now I'll turn over real quick to Hebrews seven. Hebrews 7, and we're going to read verse 25. Hebrews 7, verse 25. Uh, just pairing scriptures up here. Um, let's start with, uh, let's start down in 23. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, meaning Jesus, because he continues forever, praise God, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, because of this unchangeable priesthood, he is also able to save to the uttermost. That's important to know why we need to be in connection or conjunction with Jesus when we pray. Because he's the one that brings the salvation of what we're praying for or who we're praying for. Amen. And Jesus has done the completed work on the cross. Remember, he said it is finished. Therefore, he still completes a completed work. God said that he watches over his word to perform it. So when we pray through Jesus, we're praying through his will and his word, and he watches over that. Say we're praying over a loved one or a friend or whatever, that when we pray his will, we can be confident 
that the uttermost desires of God will happen in that situation. You understand? Because all things work through a root, seed and root. You know, we don't want to just chop off the limbs if that's the issue. We want to get down to the root of the matter so that there is a complete everlasting change. Amen? Um, just a quick example. We know people that they've had an experience with God and they talk Jesus, but they really probably have not because you can tell by the fruit. Can I, we be, talk here? That you can see they haven't had a real conversion in their heart. You understand? Because it wasn't an utter work. But it doesn't mean we, that can't still happen. So you follow with me here. So therefore, he was able to save to the uttermost. Somebody say uttermost. Those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Um, and the word make intercession there is translated like this. It means this, to fall in with, to meet with, in order to converse. So the idea of much echoing what uh, my wife said is that what we're after here is that he's wanting us to fall in line with what he's doing. It's about being in line with him. Amen? So I'm trying to set a stage here to, to make a highlighted point. So I want to get things in order. Um, I want to feel impressed to say this as much what my wife said, but we also know in Acts 1 um, where he said that I remember he said I, after the uh, um, upper room experience and they're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, therefore, I charge you to go into all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even the ends of the earth. Amen. So uh, I agree very much. There is certain parameters that you work within and such. But um, I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to say this, but and maybe this is what you were talking about. I think, but if you're in someone's jurisdiction, say if you're in someone's home, I know for, I was thinking of my wife, actually. She's a visiting nurse, so she sees people all day, every day. And some of them, she gets to know them for a while. Some of them, it's only a day or two visit. And, but when they're there, they'll start to converse. Inevitably, somehow it always turns to Jesus almost every time. And through that process, though, they'll say, oh, would you pray over my home? Or would you pray for my son? Or would you pray? They're giving her now jurisdiction to do that. Amen? So when you're interceding for someone, it's also good to have, um, by the Spirit, but I'm talking, a, is a, be a good listener. You know, intercession or prayer, the first ingredient is to be a good listener. Then you talk well. You understand? And in order to pray, uh, I'm talking about when you're talking with people particularly, but also when we're interceding and listening to the Holy Spirit. But people will tell you things without realizing they're telling you things. You know, a lot of people are not comfortable with just coming out and saying things. But <clears throat> a heart of an intercessor is, is very sensitive to what people's needs are without them even saying it. And you don't necessarily have to say something to them, you know. Um, being an intercessor, sometimes you get... Uh, understanding of a person's situation, but it's very private. So I think it's much, again, something she had said that um, God, I think I said this last week when we were here, that if he tells us in his word not to throw our pearls to swine, I don't think he does either, you know? Um, so the, the information you get on a person, a church or whatever, it's very precious to God. And we have to understand that it's valuable to him and we have to handle it accordingly. Amen. With respect. We want to stay away from the, uh, you know, a lot of times we know in church circles, we'll end up, what we're really doing is gossiping. You know, say, oh, would you play for sister so-and-so because she, oh my God, you know, <laughs> she's been, you know, no, all right, let's just cut the, what you want to do is just complain about the person, right? You know, so let's be careful of that. Um, moving on, where do I want to go here? Uh, oh, let's go over to Luke, Luke 10. I know, uh, Karen, Pastor Karen, I just mentioned she gave that scripture not long ago. And earlier today, the Lord led me to this, asked me to share this point. Luke 10, 17, and we're going to read through 23 and do a three quick breakdown here. <clears throat> so starting verse 17, Luke 10, and then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. All right, yes. And he said this to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So he's confirming what they're saying here. But notice quickly, he sets them in the right place. 
Behold, now that's a big word that we often skin over. Behold means to lay your eyes upon and gaze at and what you're looking at, let it impart unto you. So you're beholding something. You're not just looking, you're beholding. You understand? Um, so behold, so we're saying, look at this, look at what I'm saying now. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, as she had said, shall by any means, see, it really accentuates it, shall hurt you. So this is all very good, and he's confirming their, their excitement. But and here he goes, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Now, there's a lot of rejoicing here. A intercessor that understands intercession in the process is a happy intercessor. Benny Johnson um, wrote a book called The Happy Intercessor. It's good reading. Um, you're happy because you know there's victory even if you don't see it yet. Amen? Somebody say amen to that. Amen. He goes on to say, I thank you, Father. Gratitude is a good position to be in, always. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who is the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And last verse, then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and have not heard it. Um, what I want to say is three things. Is First one I already said it, is to rejoice. The word rejoice here means to be full of cheer. Amen? You can be praying for someone. I think our friend Linda here, we were talking last week, and when you're interceding, you may kind of sense, you know, if they're uh, under attack with depression, you may sense that depression because that's what you're encountering, and that's you know, accurate, but from a heart of good cheer, you're full of cheer, amen, because you know that the God of love will conquer all things, amen. You know there's an expectant victory, no matter how long it takes, no matter how bad it looks, no matter what it is at the moment, love always wins, amen. Okay, now he goes on, I wanted to highlight the word babes. He said, but I've given it to babes, right? He said, I haven't hidden these things, I've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but I've revealed them to the babes. It's important that as intercessor to have a childlike heart. And what I mean by that is that uh, you're having a pure, receptive, believing type heart. You're like a child. You believe his word, you rejoice in his word because you believe that daddy's going to do what he said, right? Uh, we all know we were all kids, we were you no know, little kids. You know, and when mom, when they've come to trust her parent, we come to trust our father, um, we know that he said, hey, I'm going to take you to the park tomorrow. You're excited, even though tomorrow's not here. But because, you know, dad said he's going to take you to the park. Amen. And we have to have that same understanding with the father in heaven, that what he said will happen because he's promised it. Amen. And uh, you can reference to Matthew 5, 8. That's one of the uh, Beatitudes. He said, blessed are the pure in heart. For they show what? See God. Amen? And then the other one, he said, down at the end, he said, he turned to his disciples. Everybody say disciples. Amen. Disciple means, uh, the word picture there is that you're at his feet. It literally is the posture that, that the rabbi, the teacher, Jesus, is standing or sitting in a, in a you know, seat, and you're literally kneeling at his feet. It's a um, posture of surrender. Uh, intercession has an inward posture to it, meaning you're the molder, I'm the clay. How do you want to mold me to intercede? Amen. Each and every, and every time to be a full intercessor, how do you want to mold me to intercede about this situation, etc.? Amen. So <clears throat> it means this. The word disciple means it's a privileged position. Why is it a privileged position? Again, as I alluded to, because he doesn't just give his pearls to anybody. Okay, 
And he goes on to say that. He said, because the prophets have desired to see what you see and have it and to hear what you hear, but they haven't. But it's because Jesus came on the scene, Jesus is in our heart, we've yielded to Jesus, therefore we know that we can have what he's telling us to say. Amen? Amen. So say, I see and I hear. Say it again. Say, I see and I hear. So it's a privileged position to know that when you go in to pray, that you know and be confident that he will show you things. Either you have an inner vision, an outward vision, you'll just begin to have what we say see, but just have a knowing Know your knower, you know, your feller and the seller, all right? Um, and you'll be able to hear. I believe that, you know, well, I just know this, maybe because I talk a lot, a lot, usually, but I believe the Lord is always talking to us. As my wife said, you may not get anything, and I understand what she's saying, but let me maybe clarify, is that he might be telling you, just be quiet for now. You know what I mean? And it may be for a few weeks, like she said, but he's always telling you, or he may be telling you something, but he's saying, I don't want you to pray that out right now. You know, wait, because all things are done decently in order, all that. Everybody got to get the, get the point, right? Okay, now, uh, next, and then we'll go to the last point I want to make. Over in James 4, James 4, 7 particularly, um, the verse in there says to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We all know that verse very well. Um, in fact, I'll turn there real quick. <clears throat> um, I want to read. Uh, let's go up to uh, up verse 6, and then we'll read through it. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives his grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. A double-minded man, what? Achieves nothing. You have to be secure in the knowledge of God. Faith comes where the will of God is known. When you know it's God's will for someone to be saved, and we know his word says that, then don't be double-minded about whether it's going to happen or not. Amen? Because what matters, I know probably I'm echoing a lot of what she says, what she already said, but obviously what you say in the time of prayer matters, but what you say outside of your time of prayer. In other words, don't be praying for this person, this person, this person, and then next week you're at church and you're talking to someone saying, you know, I've been praying for so-and-so, but I don't, I don't know. You know, I saw them the other day and they were like whacked out. You know, you're nullifying Actually, what you're doing, you know how you're nullifying by your words, but you're also contaminating your own faith. Amen. You can contaminate your faith, your own faith, by what you say. Come on. All right. I know I'm talking to somebody. Maybe somebody. I don't know. Sometimes we just talk too much. Okay. Um, but here's the point. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There's a perfect order right there. Submit to God first. Then resist the devil, and he will flee. As I learned from my son, God is love, the devil is hate. I know it's very simple, but we're kids, aren't we? So in other words, submit to love, and hate will flee. Now the word love, we're talking about agape love here. Unconditional surrendered love. Amen. Okay? So that being said, I want to go to my last point. I think it's my last point. Yes, okay, last point. We're going to go over to, um, let me find it. Yep, okay. Ephesians 6. We're talking about wrestling here. So I wanted to lay this out. So in other words, we know that what I'm about to tell you, the reason we can do and maybe all, everything we said for the last three classes, why we can do, including what I'm going to share with you, is what I just previously said. First of all, we've honored Jesus in our life. I would encourage you again and again and again, before you go into prayer, make sure you're already in prayer. You know, making sense? Worship Jesus for a while. Pray in the Spirit. Cultivate. I've been hearing the word cultivate in my spirit for a while now. We have to cultivate ourselves. Amen? And cultivate a lifestyle of surrendering to God 
And because you can begin to enter, I can't tell you how many times I felt a, we'll call it a spirit of intercession, when it's Holy Spirit just moving you. And I'm, quote, minding my own business. I'm not in a planned meeting. I'm not in my prayer closet. I'm driving. Um, I'm walking, taking out the trash. And boom, Lord say, pray for so-and-so. You know, some people may not, well, it doesn't matter. But it was about, oh, maybe it was a year ago or something. And <clears throat> we were in worship at church. And I'm worshiping God and everything. And I felt such an urgency in my spirit to pray for Hillary Clinton. And worship got done. And it was such a compulsion that, I mean, I didn't even transition. I just got the mic and said, we have to pray for Hillary Clinton now. And everybody submitted. We just started praying. I don't know what it was about. Maybe to the Who knows? I don't know. But I just know we need to pray. So it's important to know that you're ready to pray at any and all times. Um, not for nothing just to say it, but, um, well, well, it's way too late to get into it. But there's something about the wee hours of the morning. There's something about the three o'clock hour. Perry Stone, if you want to look it up, he talks about this a lot, about three o'clock in the morning. My mom in the spirit, Bobby G. Merck, I uh, was just talking about, she calls it the witching hour. I can't tell you how many times I've been woken up and I look and it's three or three something or I'm praying. I just feel like I don't even look at the clock and then I happen to look at the clock while I'm praying and it's three something. And boy, there's I mean, I am praying about something, pacing the floor, just laying in bed, praying for who knows or whatever, you know. Um, so it's what I'm saying by that is be willing to go to bed knowing you might get woken up. Amen. And knowing that he gives his beloved sweet sleep. So don't get subtracted thinking, oh my God, I got to get up in three hours. Jesus got it. All right? Okay, so here's my point I want to make with you. Okay, Ephesians 6, and starting verse 10. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I'm going to read at verse 10 down to 13. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against dark powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. Now, the one word that I felt since we, I got ready for this whole classes of doing this is I want you to look at the word first of all power of his might okay he says it in there it's by this that we can do anything we do it for him therefore we can do it by him anything that we do now we're talking about intercession here when we cast down and throw down bind and loose loose and bind speak and everything because one thing I want to I want to leave this with you tonight because I believe there is an adjustment that the church I call a transition is going through and some of it's going to wreck your doctrine a little bit, wreck my doctrine, because sometimes we've been ingrained in something and we wake up to like, whoa, that's not really what that was. And here's one of the things I want to say to you. We've never been called to be mountain climbers. So get it out of your mind that you have to strive to overcome something. He has called us to be mountain dissolvers. Mark 11, you speak to that mountain. God meant what he said and he, meant what he, when he, and he spoke what he meant. He said, speak to that mountain. He didn't ask you to wrestle with the mountain. He said, speak to it. Come on. I know, right? Okay, so it's, but we do this, I'm um, trying to find my notes, by the strength, so the power of his might means this, by the strength of his force and ability. By the strength of his force and ability. So when we pray his word, whether it's literally his scripture or his will, his word, his will, his desire, his army of angels. Remember, Jesus is the captain of the Lord of hosts. That's pretty powerful. Are immediately active in doing what needs to be done. I want to remind you again that you have commanding angels that are assigned to you or a situation that you're in. There's angels that have been assigned to a Carver Township. Because you may go to Praise Tabernacle and you're here, there is a realm of authority that you have when you pray over this region that angels are being released to bring the desired effect. It's important to go into that. And as I think I said last week, to have a vision in your heart of the seed, 
of already the fruit being desired because that's what will take you from the seed to the fruit in intercession. Knowing these things, and one of them is, I know she covered a lot, but it's knowing that there are angels waiting at your bidding to move. Now here's, I'm finally getting there, and this is where I want to go. The word wrestle. Everybody say wrestle. wrestle. Now this excites me, <clears throat> but we got to keep it in balance. Everybody say balance. balance. Okay, the word wrestle there, I'm going to read this scripture again, explain it, and then we'll kind of start wrapping this up. Um, for we do not wrestle... So there is a conflict, there is an engagement, okay, against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts, wickedness, and heavenly places. The word wrestle means this. This is really important to help you with your image, maybe because it just helped mine, but it means this. It means to throw. It means to throw, and, I mean, and then it says in this, so it's, got, it's a little wordy, but I, this is very important for you to write down. It means to throw in various applications. To throw in various applications. Or applying how you're throwing in various applications. Okay? It means, and then going along with this thought. So I hope I'm not being confusing here. So it means to throw in various applications, more or less violent or intense more or less in violence or intense. The last point I want to explain to you real quick. Last week, as you, we had talked about um, that we were going to Lake Lenape Park to pray. And we went and prayed. One thing I want to tell you, intercessors are hardy. Intercessors do not allow the mission to be thwarted because of weather or tiredness or other distractions. It was rainy. It was not nice out. It was dark. We went. We had an assignment. A message from God. And we went there, and as we began to pray, we immediately sensed, I think my wife acknowledged, it was seven, uh, six of us there, I think. And in my mind, I was, I guess without real, I was expecting some level of resistance, but there wasn't really any resistance. So I know, I'll call it the gang, but the gang at Praise Tabernacle had been praying already. Praise God, thank you. Teaming together. Um, it's kind of Air Force and boots on the ground. Let's hit them in every way. So we're in there praying, but there was little to almost no resistance. So there's a more or less violent. We didn't have to do a lot of violence. It was already kind of there, but we still threw him down. Amen? Now, we didn't spend a lot of time binding and loosing. We just spent our time there declaring who Jesus is over this place. Amen? Okay? So moving on, the word wrestle also means this. It's this one and then one more, and then we'll be done with that. The word wrestle all means, also means this, arise, A-R-I-S-E, arise, <clears throat> to cast out like dung. That's what it means. Look it up. To cast out like dung. How do you guys handle dung? You like dung around? No? And you want it out and you want it fast? You don't worry. You want it gone, right? That's the imagery. We're talking about imagery here. It means to cast out or rise it up and cast it like dung. All right? It also means to send, to strike, to throw down, and to thrust. Send, strike, throw down, to thrust. You caught up with me? All right? I don't want to... Okay, and the last one, wrestle means this. It means to fling, F-L-I-N-G. It means to fling. I encourage you, when you study this thing, go through the Greek and even down into the Hebrew. Because it, so the Hebrew will give you fantastic, wonderful word pictures. The word fling literally means as if it was like, yep, just fling it off. You're fling, like you're flinging off your jack when you walk in the house, you know? It means to fling. It means properly with a quick toss. Properly with a quick toss. In other words, the way to do it. And then the last, uh, with that, it means a deliberate hurl. A deliberate hurl. Anybody need, want me to repeat anything? You got it? To fling me, or it means to fling, it means to properly with a quick toss or a deliberate hurl. Now the idea is this, is that it's not denying that there is a warfare going on. There is a conflict.
But the thing is that each and every time that it's no difference in me taking this paper because of all the staging that we talked about for three weeks and you're able to do this. You understand what it is? That there's no weapon formed against you that can prosper. The weapons will be formed, but they will not prosper. You may not be able to have them existing, but you have every legal right to have them lasting. Come on. That's what we're talking about, Lake Lenape, or in your own life, or anything else. And everything I just described you with the wrestling, because Jesus is Lord, you surrender to him, everything is done decently in order, and you speak to that thing, and it has no business having any mastery over your life. Jesus is the master of our life. Come on. Je let me end it with this. Satan is a flesh devil. He is a soul devil. If there's any conquering of Satan in your life or situation, it's because the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion has not gotten in line with the Word of God in order to function with the Spirit of God to see the fruit of God. But that was good what I just said. You hear that? Come on. Because you renew your mind. You renew means to rent. See, it's getting too late to get preaching now. You got to renovate. We're closing. We got folks coming out, but we renovate our mind. That's what we've been talking about the whole time, to get ourselves in line with what has already been done through Jesus Christ. We don't have to work it up and plead, beg, and borrow, and steal from Jesus. He said it's finished. He said, now apply what I've already done. Amen? So I want to encourage you, and it's the last thing I'm going to say, is that everything we shared, everything we learned, everybody else shared, cultivate this attitude, this spirit, this desire for intercession. Please do not, and we don't, Take these notes of what everything you've learned, and not because of Pastor Karen and I, but for the sake of the kingdom of God, and just set them on a desk somewhere to forget about them. Cultivate this attitude of intercession, because I believe part of the churches of this area and everywhere is that every area is that there is a spirit of intercession that's rising up. Amen? Amen. And it's going to take dominion for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.